Thanks for being here. It's a great pleasure to be on this stage again. Been here a few times and it's a great venue. I like it. Um, so this talk is about how our culture influences the way we communicate. In our uh, open source projects, we have people from lots of different cultures. And I think that often gets in the way of how we communicate, how we understand each other, or how we misunderstand each other. Uh, so I'm, my name is Bertrand de la Creta. I'm from the uh, French-speaking part of Switzerland. I work for Adobe in uh, Basel, Switzerland, German-speaking part. Already two slightly different cultures. You'd be surprised. Uh, I'm a principal scientist at, at uh, Adobe, so kind of an internal consultant doing architecture in the Java content management space. I'm also on the board of directors of the Apache Software Foundation, where uh, I love listening to the accents on the board call. We have an Australian guy, we have Ross Gardler who's from the UK, we have American people, European people, and that also tells something about the culture, and I think it's, a, it's an asset. So really, having, I think having this cultural diversity, it's actually a great benefit for our communities, because if, if you think slightly differently, you will, you will expose different things you will, uh, you know, you will see problems that others might not see because in their culture it's not a problem. And I think it, it's really an asset. It's, uh, it's something that, that, that we should try and take advantage of. But for this, uh, on the other hand, it makes communication harder. And I have a few examples, including some pretty dramatic ones where the culture and language and everything gets, gets in the way. And it's harder... Uh, I, I enjoyed this morning's uh, talk on empathy a lot, but it, it, it was mostly about face-to-face -face communication. And when you're talking on a mailing list or on a, on a, on a chat channel or whatever, it's harder because it's a low bandwidth channel. You know, it, it's writing. It, it's uh, it's not as expressive as you know if I talk to you like that, you will say, okay, this guy is, is a bit depressed, so we might be, be kind with him, you know. And if I'm here being the winner, then maybe you're th thinking this guy is being a bit uh, arrogant. It's not good. In writing, it's harder to make this kind of, of, you know, expressions. I'm wondering how many cultures we have in the room. Can you yell, what's your culture? I'm Swiss French. Franconian. Yes. Italy. Deutsch. Deutsch. I'm from India. India. South Pacific. South Pacific. I like that. British and European. Yes. <laughs> Multicultural. <laughs> yes. So we have many cultures. And uh, do we have any soccer fans? Yes. Do we have any sailors? Musicians? Trumpet players? No trumpet players. Drummers. You're my friend. I'm a drummer. <laughs> really, you know, culture is, is not just the country where you're from. There, there are many facets to the culture. And if you talk with soccer fans, I'm not a soccer fan, but <laughs> you might have some language or, or idioms. You know, uh, in, the, in the U.S. people, they, they will often say, you don't get past first base. What, what do you mean? What, what's first base? You know, if you know the game, it's obvious. If you don't know it, you don't know. So that culture is much more than just the country where you're from or the, the language that you speak. The typical failure scenario when a disaster happens in our communities, and, but we'll see also in other places, you have a bad decision initially. That happens. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. You make a mistake. Okay. The problem is in the middle. You have misunderstandings. There's no course correction. You know, when you do a mistake, you need to fix it. And it means if you're steering a car or boat or motorcycle, changing your, your course. If you don't understand each other, this doesn't happen, or it happens in the wrong direction. And that's when disasters happen. This is a pretty small disaster here on the right, but it can get much worse, as, as we'll see. I could have many examples from the Apache Software Foundation, and that, that was my initial idea. I've been in the, the ESF for 17, 18 years now, 
So I've seen and participated and initiated a number of mistakes, and we could talk about these, and some of them would be funny more than, than some others, <laughs> but we survived, and the SF survived. But I find some interesting examples from other fields. So you might be a bit surprised by my, my examples, but I think they, they give a different uh, context to things. So I, I, I'm a sailor. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have my sailing instructor in the room, Emmanuel. He was on stage before, but he's, he's also a great sailor and a great instructor. And when you're sailing, the first thing you should do is plot your course. You know, de you know decide how you, which direction you're going to, stay, to sail in order to stay safe. And this is an example. You have an island and you want to sail past it, pretty close to it, because you want to see the scenery or show your boat to whoever's on the island. So you, you plot your course with the red arrows. And uh, OK, so you decide, OK, we'll do this bearing. And then at, at this point here, uh, it will change the, the, the bearing and go to another direction. And then there's wind, 17 knots of wind, uh, the black arrow here, east, northeast. The, the wind is pushing you towards the shore. So you have to be careful. Don't, you know, don't mess up. And then if you zoom in, so this is a pretty rough uh, map chart. And then if you zoom in, you start seeing that there's actually some serious rocks near, the, near this shore. And if you zoom in even more on the right, uh, the, the yellow part, this is, this is uh, ground the, that you don't want to hit with your boat. The small crosses, that's rocks. You don't want to hit them. So you're going to sail in this direction, and then the wind will be pushing you towards the, the shore. And it's kind of dangerous. So I'm not sure if it was a good idea. Whoever did this chart, they might, might not have been a fantastic idea. But you have crew, right? You're not alone on your boat. If it's a big boat, you have several people. So you're kind of counting on them to say, help your course correction. Hey, captain, you know, for, if I'm the first mate with Emmanuel as a captain, I would say, Emmanuel, captain, I think that's a bit dangerous. Should we really do that? Or how do we stay safe even with this slightly hairy course? And if you don't communicate well, uh, that's when disasters happen. And this is actually, it's, it's, not, it's not a fun thing. It's a, it's a dramatic accident that had happened. You probably heard of the Costa Concordia. And I've, I've been reading the, the accident reports. And it's pretty, it's interesting in a sad way. Because the, it's really, you know, you could say, okay, the, the captain did a big mistake to, to decide to sail so close to the, to the coast. But then, he was not alone on his boat. And that, you know, there's first mate, there's people who have some authority to challenge the captain's decisions, or at least say something. And, and you know, it was a bit hard on that boat, because uh, on that ship, I should say, uh, 38 different nationalities on the boat. So we need to find a common language to communicate, despite all the different cultures and everything. And the, the company decided that the working language was Italian. Because the boat is Italian, the boat's papers are Italian. So let, let's speak Italian. Why not? I'm not sure if it's, a, the, you know, I, li I love Italian. It sounds great. And, and I love Italian people and Italy, but it's not the most common language. Yeah, it's not the language where you have the most, uh, you know, chance of finding people who, who understand it properly. And even then, the, the first engineer testified that he did not fully understand the orders uh, given in the Italian language. So, you know, first engineer. It's someone important. You should make sure that the communication gets through. And then the, help, the helmsman, the guy who's actually steering the boat, testified that at times he did not understand the master's orders where, when given in English. So you have a serious communications problem. And that's when, when disasters happen. And you have examples here and, and bad decisions like, you know, going 16 knots so close to the coast. It's pretty dangerous, but it... I think that this could still be avoided if someone, would, you know, or a few people said, Captain, this is not going well. We need to do something else. We need to communicate properly and change course in order to, to avoid the disaster. Did not happen, unfortunately. So I think it really demonstrates this, this, uh, this you know, sequence, a bad decision. I think the, and, and the chart that I was showing is the actual chart that they recovered from, from the ship which is not a very detailed chart. You know, they, they should have used first a much more detailed chart and, and, and plotted 
they should have floated a, a much safer course. It was dangerous to start with. But then the real problem is that there was no course correction. Nobody fixed the thing, and then you get the big disasters uh, and a very sad one in this case. Luckily, usually for us, the stakes are not that high, but still, if you, know, if you do a bad job, uh, there, there probably are, are some life-preserving devices that run on Apache software or software from whatever uh, community you're in. So it's still serious stuff. And then, you know, the story of the Tower of Babel, all the, all the different languages. I, it would be interesting to count how many languages we have in the room. We probably have, I don't know, maybe 20 different languages at least. And even the language is not everything. There's all the subtle cultural things that, you know, don't get through because uh, different idioms. If I tell you there's a, there is a zebra crossing around the corner, for some people a zebra crossing is, you know, something that you use to cross the street as a pedestrian. And others will figure a zebra, the animals crossing a river. And, and this, is this in Berlin around the corner? It sounds really funny, funny guy, you know? And uh, when you meet people, how do you, how do you cheer? You know, in, in, in Switzerland, if I meet friends that I know well, I would do, kiss them on the cheek three times. In France, it's four, or sometimes two, it's two. It depends on the region. And then my people, my kids are around 25, 30 years old, and, and the first time you meet them, they will do that. They will, they will kiss you on the cheeks, even if you don't know the person. And for me, no, you know, it's usually because I know the person well. All these small things, cultural things. Um, I, I was lucky to travel to Australia to an Aboriginal uh, preserve uh, to go fishing, and we, we are, were supposed to get a guide. So you go there, and you meet the people, and you shake hands, and you look them in the eye, and then someone said, no, Bertrand, you, you know, if you shake hands to these people, it, might, it means you want to fight. And if you look them in the eye, it's, it's, uh, you're trying to show that you're stronger than them. It, it's not something you want to do. You know, and in my country, uh, if I don't shake hands, I don't look people in the eye, it's impolite. So, you know, subtle or not so subtle uh, cultural things, the gestures, you know, the, 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 the divers, okay, in some countries means something very bad. So, you have to be careful with that. How do you cheer when you drink? Here at the conference, we're going to have beers later. You know, how do you it's very cultural, and, and, it, it, and you, can, you can come across as rude because you don't do things in the way the people uh, uh, expect. The, there's a rubber in the UK, this thing here, the eraser, is called a rubber. In other countries, it means something very different. Uh, and, you know, and Colm McCarthy, uh, and a guy from Apache, wrote that on Twitter. Was it a good funeral when you went to a, to a funeral? In Ireland, it's something you're expected to ask. Was it a good funeral? In some countries, what do you mean good funeral? Are there any good funerals? So it's all very subtle things, which can be awkward when you're meeting people in person, but I think they also influence the way we communicate in, in writing on our, on our mailing lists or, or whatever. The jokes are also very cultural. This is a, you know, this is a joke from my country. Um, and then when you, when you tell the jokes, you, you might get faces like that. Someone fi finds it extremely funny, and the other person is offended, because in their culture, it's not something you, you're supposed to joke about. And sometimes say, what, what you say? Is that even a joke? You know, what's the difference between a duck? Usually, the first question you get is, a duck and what? No, what's the difference between a duck? Uh, Actually, the difference is that both the legs are of the same length, especially the left one. <laughs> you know, some people will find it funny. Some people will find it completely stupid. <laughs> some people will even wonder if it's a joke. You know, it's difficult. And, and that's the kind of things that, that usually can go bad between cultures. And you look stupid or you offend people without... Uh, I hope this is, will not offend anyone. It's not a very, very risky one, but there are some risky jokes, and you have to be very careful about that. Another cultural thing is uh, how you express your appreciation or not. In my country, in my region, if I say, it's pretty okay, that's very positive. You know, if I say something is pretty okay, I'm being very enthusiastic about it. 
Whereas some other countries will say, yeah, it's amazing, it's great, it's fantastic what you did here, Bertrand, I like you, I love you, I've loved you forever. And, you know, it's very clear appreciation. Whereas if I tell you it's pretty okay, you know, it's not fantastically expressive appreciation. So here we have someone else on Twitter saying, you know, the opposite. When some, something's wrong, you can say, this is wrong. Or you can say, I'm sorry, but um, isn't there a small problem here with this thing? And it, in the end, it means the same thing, but you were do, telling it differently. I have a work colleague that tends to very often say, this is wrong. And it makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't like that. You know, I, I like to have a, at least be given an option how to fix it or, or something a bit subtle. But it, it's, it's not, it, there's, there are no bad intentions. He means right. He, he means to fix the problem, but in a way that doesn't go well with my, my cultural background. This is typical to French, not all languages, uh, I don't know, a few languages have this, the tu and vous, you know, in, in English it's you. But even in English there's some polite form. You know, if I say uh, Miss Kranz or I say Merle, that, that's, one of them is kind of more polite than the other. And then how do you decide? This is a flowchart for deciding in French. It's kind of on the funny side, but it's not that wrong, you know. If, if you're a kid talking to an adult, you'll say vous. And if an adult is talking to a kid, they'll say tu, which is a familiar form. And, if, you know, and, and then you meet someone having beers, and you say tu, and then you figure out this person is the president of your country, and then you meet them in a different setting, and you say vous, you, the, the polite form. It's very subtle, and, and it can also go wrong when you change countries. I'm sure between France and Canada, for example, both speak French, but I'm sure the, the use is quite different when you say tu and when you say vous, polite form. So this is also something that, that, can, that can throw you off. And even, as I say in English, th there are some polite forms, even there's just you. When you speak directly to people, uh, you can make a face. You know, if, if I look at you like this, you can imagine that I'm, I'm not being totally happy. And, and when you speak directly to people, you can get this feedback much quicker by, by making a face showing that you don't understand or you disagree or you, you're kind of thrown off. It's very easy. In writing, it's much harder. You know, it's, it's, uh, you have to be much more explicit, saying, I am uncomfortable with this or I, I don't understand what you're saying, maybe because of my culture. You know, you have to be more... It's, sometimes it sounds a bit complicated, but but you have to do that. So, so you don't have the luxury of making a, a face to express what, what, you, what you have. So it's really complicated. The, um, you know, we, due to the fact that we're communicating and writing asynchronously, it makes the whole thing much more complicated. And culture. Uh, so, in the beginning, you know, when I was asking about culture, most people will say they, where they come from, which country or which language. And uh, here we have an example where I think, uh, so you probably know about this, another, dis another sad disaster. It's not funny at all, but it's interesting to study how these things happen and try to find out how, how you can avoid them next time. This is uh, the Challenger Space Shuttle from 1986, which exploded after a few seconds of flight. And the thing is that when they launched it, they, they already had launched a number of shuttles. You see uh, in the, the diagram in the middle, it's from Edward Tufties. Uh, Edward Tufty is a, is a professor who, who's been writing a few fantastic books on how you visualize information. And the diagram in the middle is Tufty's diagram to show the problem. The dots, the black dots that you have on the, mostly on the right, they are the successful launches and the higher, the more problems they had with the O-rings, a type of uh, joints, you know, seals that, that uh, had problems in, in, the, in the Challenger shuttle. So we kind of see a curve like that, and, and it gets worse as the temperature gets lower, and the, the, the green ellipses here is where the, the, this problematic launch was. So it was much colder than the, the other launches, there, were, there was ice on the ice pad, it was minus uh, freezing point during the night. And for many engineers, it was obvious that it was very risky to launch the shuttle 
because the, the, these O-rings were not designed for such cold temperatures, and they were not exactly sure what might happen, and then the worst happened. The problem is that, part of the problem is that the engineers ha were not able to communicate the problem in, 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 a, in a suitable way to the, to the managers who were making the decisions. So here you have an engineering versus managers culture. And, and those are slightly different cultures. You know, as engineers, if I put this a bit, uh, you know, in a very schematic form, as an engineer, I want to do a fantastic engineering job. I want my software to be perfect, to have no bugs, to be nice, to be, you know, cute to read or any, anything you can imagine. As a manager, I want to sell the shit. You know, I want to sell the product and make money so that I can pay the engineers so they can feed their families and have a house and live. It's kind of, you know, it might be opposing constraints and, and then it influences your culture in a way. And, and so what I'm saying here is that the culture can be much more than just where you come from or what language to speak. And in the, 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 the box here, John primary concern that you can, probably can't really read, it was, it's a typical engineering report. They, they, they're listing items, you know, temperature is low, the joint, the, the O-rings might have problems, and the thing might explode, but it's just bullet points. You know, and whereas if someone would have come up with such a diagram, like in the middle, it might be m much more obvious for the, the manager to say, it doesn't make sense to launch this, this thing. Let's not launch it. So the, the culture can hide in, in unexpected places. So this doesn't make our job better. It's very complicated, and, and then we have to find ways to, to fix it and avoid these problems. So how we can avoid them is by acting in this middle uh, element of my diagram. The bad decisions, as I, as I think it's obvious, the bad decisions, they happen. Everybody makes mistakes. And in a group, it, you know, an in initial bad decision can happen. What we can influence is, can we discuss more efficiently, have better communication so that we can course correct and avoid the disasters? So let's try to see how we can fix this. In the end, it's, yeah, it's, it's just about the communications. An interesting example from also a slightly different field. I, I recently found out that the, the aviation, airline industry, they have defined and standardized a simplified English language for, for the technical manuals for, for airplanes and, and you know, everything that goes around uh, aviation. And it's a great way to make it easier because part of the problem is also that, that for most of us, English is our second or third or fourth language and it's not our native language. So we might not master all the subtleties of English. So, and it's the same thing in the aviation manuals because you have people doing aviation maintenance from very different uh, countries and, and mother, language, mother tongues. So they have defined this ASD, ASD STE100 language, which is a simplified version of English with only, uh, I think only like a thousand words. And it has lots of examples on, of how you should phrase things so to make them understandable. Here we have an example from the Robert, Ruhl's, Robert Bertuel's website. Uh, for example, instead of saying all valves must be turned slowly, you say turn all valves slowly. You know, active voice, present tense, very simple phrases, shorter phrases as well. Remove everything that's not to absolutely required, make it concise, make it simple. And I think that's a great thing that we can do uh, in, on, in our communications, on our mailing lists, on, on our discussion uh, channels, to stick to simple language. We have some people, I know some, some in Apache, who are fantastic writers and they write very nice phrases, very sometimes exotic and a bit complicated, uh, express things in a subtle way it's not very good for the others. You know, uh, you're not an, I'm not a na native English speaker, and even after 17 years in the Apache Software Foundation, I have to look up words sometimes. Even in the, in the board meetings, on the board calls, we have a back channel on the IRC, on chat, and sometimes I ask, what does a person mean with this idiom, with this expression, because I don't know it. So by, by you know, sticking to a simple language, making your communication simpler, you can help uh, get your message across. To avoid misunderstandings, this is, 
you know, this is communications 101. But I think it's, it's simple uh, principles that we should, we should uh, use when communicating. Assume good intentions. You know, when you get an email and okay, you think people are being rude or they're, they're considering you as an idiot or, you know, not taking your, your value added into account or whatever, figure, figure out this, this care bear here. This care, care bear here, that's a difficult one. Uh, you know, imagine people, usually people want to be nice. And even if they don't, you should assume they will. They won't, you know. Uh, if you react immediately with a nasty email and, and things can escalate very quickly. So it's always a good idea to assume good intentions. How, you know, what is the person really trying to do? Or even if they're being a bit nasty, usually it's for the sake of the project, hopefully, you know, you can try to find something positive. Uh, this was also something that was said in this morning's empathy talk, where they have these retrospectives where everyone has to say something positive about someone else. It, it's a good thing to do, and, and I think we should try to do that to avoid escalating uh, things. And then ask for clar cl clarification. Very often, uh, the message is not as you understood it, or even the person has a message in their mind and what they wrote is not exactly that. There, there, you know, there's some shift and then it turns into something nasty, even though at the beginning it was, uh, you know, supposed to be, to be, it was good and with good intentions. So you should always do that, reformulate, you know. Uh, I, I'm always trying to do that when we have difficult discussion in one, in one of our projects, I always reformulate what I understood, you know. If I understand correctly, you are saying that, such and such, and then it's a good check. And then if someone is really some, saying something nasty, you can reformulate it, in, you know, but keeping the nastiness. You know, if I understand correctly, you are saying that I'm not capable of doing that job. If you think that's what the people are saying, it's fine. Reformulate it like that without being aggressive, but expressing what you, when you, you understood. And then you will go through these cycles a few times and hopefully get to the, to the right message. The problem can be sometimes our ego. You know, I don't want to look weak or I don't want to look too much like a care bear. It's, you know, it's not my style. So, so you have to be careful and, and sometimes just throw your ego out of the window and, and re just try to be nice for the sake of the project. I was telling about um, I come in Apache, one of the first communities where I was involved with Cocoon. And uh, Cocoon was a fantastic community because it was mostly small companies or independents and we all had a business based on Cocoon. So when we disagreed, we didn't say, okay, I'm out of here, bye. No, I need to stay in this project because it's my business. So we found ways to fix it. And we, we talked and discussed and clarified until we found some agreement. And I think that that's a good example. Depending on your stakes in a project, you're not just going to walk out. You, you, you will fix things, and that, that's great. Another thing that can help is graphics. When you have to explain something complicated, it's much better to do a drawing, a diagram, or, or whatever. You know, here, typically, this is also something cultural. In, in Switzerland, we have four official languages. So all, all our road signs are, are, you know, pictograms. They are graphic because you, if we needed to, to write something like dangerous turn, we would write, have to write this in four languages. It doesn't work. So you do, you do a nice pictogram. I think I like the, I like the graphic on the right. It, it's very clear. Be careful with old people. You know, that I think most or Hopefully, all cultures would recognize it like that. So graphics can help if you have to express something complex. Another thing is uh, we are lucky we are writing on code. So uh, if you have to explain something, I, I don't like the, the long technical discussions. You know, you write an email with 25 paragraphs explaining what you want to do. Do it. You know, do a prototype and show it to, to, the, to the others. Even if it's ugly, unfinished, uh, not stable, whatever, it's often much more expressive than explaining it. You know, if you can show some code or, or even some code excerpts, and that's a luxury that we have. Um, even though the, the right th written form is harder, we know how to code, and often we know how to express ourselves pretty, much, pretty well with code. So that's, uh, that's something that can also 
help us get clear communications. If you do fantastic jokes like the duck one, uh, be explicit about them. You know, say, okay, in the extreme, you'll say, now I am going to tell you a joke. And it's a joke from my culture, so maybe you will not like it, but I, l I like to tell you this joke. And, you know, in, in email, you can put a joke marker or irony or sarcasm or whatever. It feels a bit strange sometimes, you know, because if, if you have to mark up your irony, it's... It's, the effect is kind of a bit lost, but it's much safer. So you have to be careful. Or maybe you can avoid it completely. I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of political correctness. It can be very boring. So I, li you know, I like to make some jokes and, and try to have some, uh, some uh, entertaining stuff in our communications, but you have to be careful and mark things clearly so people know, are you being serious or not? Uh, and very often you see that on our mailing list. You know, sometimes someone writes, a, uh, a sentence, another person re replies kind of uh, somewhat angry, and the, o the other says, yeah, but I was joking. So, you know, if you're joking, put at least a smiley or something that, that helps people find out. I have a few examples of, of, you know, how to phrase things. So, so you leave it open and, and you try to bring the, the temperature down and, and calm things down. Uh, the left one is one that I wrote on an internal mailing list at, at work recently. I'm freaking out when I see comments that imply that we might be married to such pro proprietary services. And then I added, I'm freaking out in a friendly way with a smiley. You know, to say I'm not angry. Freaking out is just a way to express that this makes me un uncomfortable. Try to, you know, maybe make a joke about yourself. It's not dangerous <laughs> for the others. Or, or you know, try to, to, as I say on the right, focus like a warrior. You want to get to your destination, but friendly like a care bear. Express things in, as, uh, in a very friendly way as possible. Uh, reformulating. I'm not sure what you mean by substandard. Do you mean I'm totally incapable of doing that, or it's just you don't like the way I wrote the code? Find out. Ask for, uh, for confirmation. Then the last one is, is when... When someone, you know, when someone will call your code a piece of shit, uh, I would reply, you could reply with calling people names, you know, but it's much better to say, what you said makes me uncomfortable. It's about me. So how can we fix it? And how can we fix it for the sake of the project? Try to, you know, leave options open for, for whoever wrote what you consider a nasty message and, and, you know, make sure you go forward for the sake of your project. Um, and, you know, again, uh, recommendations about communications 101. I think being direct helps. Don't take too many detours. If you're unhappy about something, it's fine to say it. If you say, I am unhappy, that's a fact. Nobody can hate you for saying that. You have the right to be unhappy. And it doesn't, you know, call other people names or whatever. Because in the end, you really want that course correction to happen. If you're in a project, you want the project, project to succeed. And there will be bad decisions, so you need to, you know, contribute to fixing them. So here's my coda. This is my musician's culture showing up. You know, I call my conclusions coda. If you don't know what a coda is, in a music piece, it's a piece that comes at the end. Okay. Uh, so really, again, I think if you can remember just one thing from, from this talk, it's, I think, this diagram bad decision followed by miscommunications leads to disaster. And we can improve that by improving the communications to make sure the course correction happens and you're not going to hit the Gilio uh, island with your ship. Uh, so it requires good communications and I think to help the communications be better, it's our job to verify that there are no misunderstandings and no hidden cultural obstacles. You know, all these subtle cultural things that we discussed, they get in the way of our communication. So it's fine to check and double check and ask for clarification, make sure you have understood, and then this can help us have more efficient communications, hopefully. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this was the first time I did this talk, so I hope it's been useful and uh, I'm open to uh, feedback to improve it for next time. Thank you. And we have four minutes and 53 seconds for questions, I think. Um, thank you for your talk. 
Um, um, I identified a problem, especially in the open source scene uh, in East Asia. Um, I mean, for us mainland uh, or European, we are, we are struggling enough with learning English. And for East Asian, it's much more difficult to learn English. And I think that's holding a lot of people off to get involved into open source communities. Yeah. It's only when they're joining big companies, then they uh, have to learn English uh, to some degree. And I think there's so much potential in that area, uh, which we cannot use. I, but I ha don't have an obvious solution. solution yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a difficulty that we see in... A, so I'm, I'm very active in, a, in Apache. Uh, we have some projects now where there's lots of people, at least I think from China, and, uh, and it's, it's a difficulty. And of course, people are much more comfortable <laughs> speaking their own language. And from the point of view of the foundation, we have to have oversight of what happens in our projects. And I don't think we have resources at this point to, to do that with non-English uh, projects. I'm hoping that this happens at some point, but then we need to have a, a clear structure of you know, translation and, and, and reporting. I totally agree that that's, uh, that's a problem. And I'm not sure. The way we can fix it is that if you speak those languages or anyone who speaks those languages should get involved and help make that happen. And we have some people in Apache who are starting to do that, but I would say it's really been beginnings of that. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. I wish I listened to this uh, this morning before I responded on an email. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my question is, how do you deal with cultures that are uh, you know, inherently closed? Uh, like you mentioned, uh, East Asia. Yeah. Um, they're inherently closed uh, for whatever reasons. They're comfortable to talk in their own language or they don't like to share. How do you uh, deal with when you're working with such people? And in a constructive way, how do you yeah. give feedback and make all of us involved? Yeah, I think, so I'm working, uh, Adobe has, uh, I think, 16,000 uh, employees currently in all over the globe. And we have some cultures where it's very hierarchical. I'm not supposed to talk directly to the engineer. I have to talk to the manager. And that, that makes, that's part of this kind of complications. I think uh, also, as was said in this morning's talk, uh, finding allies is a key. Finding the few people who, who will get in with your uh, way of doing things and then encouraging them to come up and do it and be examples for others. That, that's one way that I can see now. Uh, it's, you cannot impose things on people. I think what works best is I, I will change my ways if I see an example from someone whom I trust. And I will tend to trust more people from my same, the same culture. You know, I trust Emmanuel because he's, he's a sailor, he's a French-speaking guy, he's a friend. So you tend to trust. It's always, I think we have an inherent in our brains, we have this wiring of us versus the others. And it's always difficult to find out who's the other. And if I consider someone the other, I will tend to trust them less. So I think if you can, you have this group of people who are not on board with your things, but you have one or two people who might be getting in. Try to, to identify those and, and work with them or encourage them to come up so that they can be examples for the others. It's, it's one small thing. I agree that, that the problem is larger than that. So I have two questions. The first one, when they hit the rock, they probably called the Coast Guard telling that they were sinking. What did the Coast Guard answer? Sorry, I, I have a hard time hearing you because yeah, I'm trying to okay. speak. Yeah, okay, you know, it was a stupid joke. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, everyone knows about the, uh, you know... Uh, oh, the VR thinking, yeah. VR thinking video. Yeah, the accents <laughs> get in the way, that's right. If you say VR thinking and the others respond, what are you thinking about? <laughs> that can be a problem. Yeah. So, my, my real question was about <laughs> uh, something different. We um, all are um, some... Préjugé, I don't know how to, to tell it in English. Preconception. Pre Preconception of, yeah, of other people from other countries. Like yeah. for French, we think that German are very strict and so yeah. on. Uh, how do you deal with those kind of preconceptions? Right. 
I think, I think we should just forget about it. So I, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I showed the thing about the Germans saying this is wrong, the, the British saying, I'm sorry, could there be a problem here? And the Americans saying, this is amazing, but maybe there's a small problem with that. Uh, this was not my text. Uh, it was just quoting someone from, from Twitter. I, I think those, that those are very, can be very nasty. And, and when, I, when I hear people saying, oh, the Germans are like that, or the, the Americans are like that, I, I tell you know, maybe some, maybe a majority of them can be like that, but don't generalize. You know, it's, uh, people have some trait, character traits that you, it's good to identify them, but I think we should be very, very careful about not generalizing. There are definitely some cultural biases which influence our communications, but they, they can be, you know, I'm sure there are some, some Germans that would react like the American in, in the, the example that I showed, or, or it, it, we have to be very, and it's also a form of racism, you know, to say, uh, because, you, because, you know, Lars, you're, you're from German origins, so I would say, Lars, I'm sure you're like that, because you you're, were born in Germany. This is totally wrong. <laughs> exactly. Oh, even, okay. <laughs> so I'm falling on my face here. But it would be totally wrong. Or Emmanuel, you, you live in Paris, so, oh, the Paris people, they're always, you know, busy and whatever. It, it, it's, it's really wrong. You have to judge the people, uh, you know, or identify the, the style by what the people actually do. And, and I, would, I think we should avoid this. They are fun in jokes, but <laughs> not, I don't, don't think more than that. I don't think that's useful. So. Bertrand, merci pour votre représentation ou votre, je ne sais pas. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, Thank presentation you. and uh, we will meet here in 10 minutes. Next.